very excited to be here today at this final outreach event connected to the nature of the beast uh, for a number of reasons, some intellectual, some arguably selfish, uh, but I do see this as sort of the culmination of the exhibit uh, in not just um, a temporal sense, but also from the standpoint of understanding and really going deep into what makes a collector tick. So I'm hoping to find answers, again, selfishly to explain some of my own obsessions and proclivities, but also to try to uncover some universal truths. And I've brought two leading experts uh, in the field, also both of whom are collectors to, to help uh, with that exploration and that process of discovery. Uh, so thanks to all of you for joining. It should be a very interesting session. With that, I'm going to introduce Dr. Michael Vinoy Adams. So Dr. Adams is a Jungian analyst with a special interest in images and the imagination. He's also the author of four books, three of which have the word imagination in the title. During the Rubin Museum's exhibition of Jung's famous Red Book, Michael was Sarah Silverman's Jungian analyst for a dialogue about Jung's technique of active imagination. Michael is currently clinical associate professor at NYU's postdoctoral program in psychotherapy and psychoanalysis, where he teaches the course Jungian Ways of Working with Images. He was previously associate provost of the New School, where he taught dream interpretation for 30 years, one of my favorite topics. Michael's also the recipient of four Gradiva Awards from the National Association for the Advancement of Psychoanalysis. For more information about Michael, you can also visit his website at www.jungnewyork.com. So let's welcome Michael. Hi, Michael. Second, um, I would like to introduce Dr. Shirley M. Muller. Um, Dr. Muller developed a passion for Chinese porcelain and, and collecting it in the late 1980s, following a successful career in the private practice of medicine and as a tenured professor at Indiana University. Consistent with the archetypal journey of the serious collector, Dr. Muller's collecting focus has become increasingly specific over time, the most recent shift being from Chinese export teapots to the fascinating subgenre of miscommunication on Chinese export porcelain to collectors, the majority of whom were based in Europe. I hope she talks more about that today. An author of more than 70 academic papers, Dr. Muller is board certified in both neurology and psychiatry and remains captivated by understanding and explaining human motivation. Dr. Muller's seminal work inside the head of a collector, neuropsychological forces at play, offers unique scientific insights drawn from her own research, as well as published studies of brain function drawing from modern technologies, such as functional MRIs, that endeavor to explain the powerful drive to seek pleasure through the process of collecting objects of desire. For more information about Dr. Muller and her work, you can visit her website, www.collectorbrain.com. You can also get more information about her book there, which I found a truly fascinating read. So welcome, both of you. Uh, thanks for joining this, this discussion this afternoon. I'm going to turn to uh, Dr. Adams first. And if you could just kind of give us a little bit of context in terms of your work, uh, as well as your process when it comes to collecting objects? What motivates you? Why do you believe you've got a desire to collect and kind of frame that in your background uh, from the standpoint of, of being a clinician as well? I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much, JD. Uh, welcome to everybody. Thank you for uh, sharing the experience with us this afternoon. Um, I'm going to just say a few brief uh, things about a psychoanalytic a book about collecting and uh, how I regard that book and how I may differ from that. Uh, and then we're going to have a, a slideshow of a few of the items that I collect. And I'll talk about my uh, interpretations of those activities. They're, they're various. I am not like JD who specializes in taxidermy and especially in taxidermy dogs. And I'm not like Dr. Muller, who specializes in Chinese porcelain. Uh, I, I put on my first slide that you'll see in a few minutes, eclectic, the eclectic collections of Michael Vanoy Adams. Um, eclectic means a variety of things that are supposed to be the best of, uh, of all of those things. 
Uh, one might even imagine I'm just a dilettante collector. I've been collecting things ever since I was a child. I'm the only um, man in America who as a boy, his, his mother did not throw out his baseball cards. So you'll see a little bit of that today. Um, but first, uh, let me talk about an experience I had a person. Um, the main psychoanalytic study of the phenomenon is the book, Collecting an Unruly Passion by Werner Munsterberger. I met Munsterberger at the New School in the 1980s when I was the associate provost of the university. He was a handsome, avuncular, genial presence, a dandy with a blazer, bow tie, and powder blue shirt. Munsterberger was himself a serious collector. After his death, his collection of African art was auctioned at Sotheby's. Munsterberger was a post-Freudian psychoanalyst, more specifically, an adherent of the theory of object relations, the school of thought that attempts to explain our relationships with objects. For Munsterberger, the most important object relations psychoanalyst for his personal purposes was D.W. Winnicott, famous for his notion of transitional objects, an example of which is Linus's dirty security blanket from Charles Schultz's Peanuts comic strips. As Munsterberger interprets the ulterior unconscious motive of collecting, it's a defensive effort to comfort the trauma of the inevitable loss of a series of emotionally significant objects over a lifetime, beginning with the infant's relation to its first object, the mother's breast. From Munsterberger's object relations perspective, collecting is a substitute gratification over and over and over again for what Freud called the oral stage of mouth on nipple. In contrast to Munsterberger, I do not regard collecting merely as a defensive reaction to the experience of loss. I remember reading a quotation from Munsterberger. I think he was quoted in a New Yorker article at some point, and he praised a, a, a patient of, of his for uh, having been well defended. Uh, my psychoanalytic work is not based on uh, helping people become more and more defensive, quite the opposite. But there is a school of thought that believes that the only reason we do things is to defend ourselves against loneliness, loss, and those kinds of things. I don't share that view. Uh, the notion seems to me simplistically reductive. I have a more positive, non-pathological perspective on the topic. For example, as a Jungian psychoanalyst, I wonder, and this is maybe something we could explore a little later, I wonder what characteristics constitute the archetype of the collector. That is, what are the typical motives and activities of a collector? Ultimately, the phenomenon that most interests me is not collectors in general, but any collector in particular, what used to be called the psychology of individual differences. In this instance, the distinctive, even utterly idiosyncratic, odd collector. So now if we could uh, have the first slide and we could go through the, the slideshow. Okay. Uh, we can go on to the second slide now, please. All right, uh, baseball cards, 1910, T206, um, and uh, cigarette cards. Um, these are cards that I collected. They're in a little album there. You can see that the album is pretty faded and all that. They use those little black, black triangles to uh, put them in, a, in the book. Uh, those would not be used anymore. They would have particular sheets that are, are cut to that exact size. Um, I don't know whether I've damaged those cards by putting those on there. I'm not going to be taking them out anytime soon. Uh, but these are cards I acquired when I was about 13 or 14 years old. Um, I bought them from collectors across the United States. There were little uh, 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 publications you, you could subscribe to. The first one on the upper left is uh, the person that I at the time thought was the greatest baseball player ever, Ty Cobb. Uh, you see some others there, Christy Matheson, Napoleon Lajouy, uh, Chase, uh, McGraw, 
And then these three uh, on the second row to the right are Tinkers, Evers, and Chance, the, the great uh, double play combination. Uh, a lot of the cards that I, I bought that were cigarette cards were um, my favorite baseball players. I wasn't just buying cards to complete a collection. Uh, the collection is so large, I couldn't have completed it anyway. Uh, you may be aware that the most famous and expensive card in the lot is the Honus Wagner card. Uh, and um, it always, if one comes up for auction, it goes for millions of dollars. I think Wayne Gretzky bought one at one point. Um, Honus Wagner supposedly asked that his cigarette cards be withdrawn because he didn't want to encourage kids uh, to use tobacco products. So that's the, uh, that's the story of that. Uh, those were collected by me when I was a, an, a, a young adolescent. Uh, and so the next slide, please. This is a special um, sentimental value to me. These are the cards that my father collected. These are his baseball cards. Uh, they are not cigarette cards. They're Colgan's Mint Chips cards, the gum that's round. Now, back in those days, uh, kids thought that their chewing gum was more important than their baseball card. When I was a, a baseball card collector in the 1950s, you had one slab of gum and five cards in a pack. But back in my father's day, he was born in 1900, so he would have been about 12 years old when Ty Cobb batted 420. Uh, the Colgan's mint chip cards had uh, several mint chips, flat mint chips, and one card. So uh, I don't know, he had to buy, I don't know, 20 uh, cans of Colgan mint chip cards to get this little collection. Anyway, it has a special value to me associated with my, my father and uh, his collecting from the uh, turn of the last century. So could we have the next uh, slide, please? This is my wife from, from, from a few years ago. Uh, She's a Dean of Humanities at uh, New York University right now. Uh, she's an expert in uh, animal studies and she's part of the environmental studies program there and in the English department and drama too. I accuse her of trying to colonize the entire university. This is a, a Howard Finster painting. It's an example of outsider art. Uh, this and the next two slides are part of my small collection of outsider art. I go to the Outsider Art Fair in New York and have for years, uh, and I've acquired some things that uh, my wife and I love to have. This is a Howard Finster. He's the itinerant uh, preacher who uh, found a, the, the, the image of Jesus on his uh, paint smeared finger that told him to stop preaching and start painting. Uh, so um, uh, this is of the planet Sorrento where, uh, I don't know, JD will be, uh, I don't know, probably disappointed because there it says no animals are rendered. They have a kind of eternal life, uh, uh, you know, so there are not gonna be any taxidermy on Sorrento. I'm sorry, JD, but you won't be able to get your collection there. Um, may I have the next slide, please? Uh, this is another piece that we own. Uh, it's by George Widener. Um, uh, he's an autistic savant. Uh, he can tell you, uh, if you give him a, a date, he can tell you instantly what day of the uh, week it was uh, at any point in human history. Uh, uh, he's a, a fantastic person. Uh, and uh, uh, he started out by painting uh, images, uh, doing outsider art of the self-taught art of the Titanic because his name, he found out, was the name of the uh, the tycoon, George Widener, who died on the Titanic. The Widener Library at Harvard University, I'm sure JD studied in the Widener all of those years, the plaque on the side of the building, Mrs. Widener donated the money for the Widener uh, Library uh, after her husband and son were killed in the Titanic. Uh, and the deed of gift that Harvard has now shamelessly broken for many years required everybody graduating from Harvard to uh, complete a swimming test before they could graduate, on the idea that if her if her husband and son had only know how to uh, known how to swim, they would have been able to avoid all those icebergs. So anyway, this is the CERN reactor in Switzerland. You can see they're searching for the God particle. Uh, there was some kind of uh, possibility that if they did all these accelerations and things like that in search of the God particle, that it would create a black hole. But they were willing to run a risk, and you see, uh, George Widener has a. Uh, has um, a sense of humor. 
Uh, his, uh, some of his works have just been acquired by the Pompidou. So may I have the next slide, please? This is a third piece of outsider art. It's the, the piece my wife and I most recently acquired. It's uh, an example of a voodoo flag. Uh, the, uh, the spirit or loa Gede, who is the uh, loa of cemeteries and funerals and all of that. Uh, this is what uh, this voodoo flag is. And it's from the studio, uh, maybe even the hand of Myrtil Constant, even though Constant is misspelled in the lower right-hand corner. You see, that's why it's from the studio. Uh, there's no doubt that it came from her because it was purchased by a person directly from her who sold it to me. But um, this is uh, you know, interesting to me because I'm interested in any kind of cultural practices that would take you to another world or where you would have uh, figures or images from another world descending in, paying us visitations in this reality. It's just another word for what we now call the unconscious. Uh, may I have the next uh, slide, please? Well, during the, especially during the COVID thing, I decided I would just have to do a billion uh, crossword puzzles. Uh, this doesn't get, this only gives you a tiny idea of what I have bought on eBay, okay? Uh, I especially enjoy uh, doing puzzles of great works of art. I find that it doesn't just pass the time, but it also, by doing them, I get some really intimate acquaintance with the actual creative process of the work. I do understand the work. I gain a great deal of knowledge by doing these puzzles. Some of them are funny, like the Nixon puzzle layer or the Dick and Elvis puzzle. You know, Elvis Presley, Presley paid uh, Richard Nixon a visit in the White House. Uh, so uh, jigsaw puzzles is another kind of collection. Uh, it's not something, it's just abstract. Now this is uh, our uh, pen and brooch collection, my wife's and mine. Uh, there, there are down at the bottom, you see a couple or two or three of the reproductions of Salvador Dali's famous um, uh, brooches, the Eye of Time brooch, the Ruby Lips brooch, and some other things. Uh, to the left of that is a merit medal from, a medal from Cretton High School in Minnesota. Uh, I thought I bought that for my amusement. I thought, well, I would like to have a merit award from Cretton uh, High School as well. Uh, there are a couple of uh, St. Michael's there. My name is Michael. There's a kind of odd phallic thing there that spells out phallic. I'm a painter, so there's a tube of paint. Uh, I like UFOs and things, so you see people in, New in Manhattan staring up at a flying saucer. Uh, in the top middle is the uh, award of the Golden Fleece. Uh, I decided if the kings of Spain and other people can get the award of Golden Fleece, I would award myself one. Nobody was giving me any medals, so I decided to do it myself. So this is a, like the kind of things I like to wear on my jackets when I go out for my amusement and other people's amusement. Uh, may I have another slide, please? Well, uh, I'm a psychoanalyst with a special interest in dreams. So I have, I have a rather large library. My wife and I moved from the village up to the Upper West Side uh, a couple of years ago. So we had to downsize. So I gave away more books than I kept but I kept all of the books that I have on dreams. Some of them are dreams, the dreams of Bill Clinton. Some of them are dreams of Madonna. Uh, some of them are kind of funny in that way. And some of them are very, very serious dreams all the way going back to Artemidorus's uh, famous uh, Greek uh, first book on dream interpretation. So may I have the next slide, please? Uh, I don't know, two or three years ago, I started a collection of postcards bought on eBay of insane asylums. I must have probably 200 of these cards now. Um, I have to say that you can't find a lot of this stuff now on eBay. It looks as if everybody has kind of bought up, you know, um, the most interesting ones. Uh, and I, this is the White Plains, uh, the, the second oldest mental hospital in America up in White Plains. Uh, New York. Uh, the one on the top right is of uh, an insane asylum in Brooklyn. It's a social event in the yard of that place. And I'm just interested in the architecture of these places, the fact that they were impressive public buildings built for people in an effort to help them. Uh, and that now they basically have vanished from the face of the earth or been turned into condos somewhere as in Montreal. So anyway, it's a uh, I was just looking, trying to look at the variety of places people house people to try to help them uh, if they were judged to be insane at the time. Uh, may I see the next slide, please? 
This is one of my prized possessions. I don't know whether you would say it's a collectible. Uh, it's certainly a relic. Uh, it's a, a, a piece of wood and a nail from the barn of Herman Melville uh, at Herman's uh, uh, farm uh, in, um, in Pittsfield, Massachusetts, which is now the headquarters of the Berkshire Historical Society. And in order to raise uh, some money to uh, make renovations to the barn and other things years ago, um, they were selling a few of these in their souvenir shop and I was fortunate enough to buy one. There's a stamp, an ink stamp of a black whale on the back. I'm sorry, it's not a white whale, but at least it's a black whale for authenticity. Uh, I, my, I did my doctoral dissertation on Moby Dick. I've written several articles on Moby Dick. When I was a child, I have a, a painting I've done of myself in the front yard of one of my grandmothers with my inflatable black whale and my inflatable yellow boat uh, with my uh, sitting in my boat with my uh, cousin Sally. So uh, whales go back a long way with me and you might say the, the reason I took my wife to her honeymoon in Pittsfield, Massachusetts to visit the Melville place uh, inflicted that sort of uh, passion on her was that it goes all the way back to that inflatable black whale, which I harpooned a week after I got it uh, in the driveway of our house with a screwdriver right in the head of the thing. That was quite, uh, uh, the whale reacted uh, explosively to, to that uh, harpooning. Uh, may I have the next uh, slide, please? Well, now this is, uh, I bought these from a, a, an important auto, auto, uh, autograph, uh, uh, business in New York City, Leonhardt, uh, uh, Lionheart Autographs. Uh, this is one of two postcards I own uh, that were sent by uh, Carl Jung in 1913 to Ernest Jones, who you may know ended up being the uh, biographer, a three volume biographer of Sigmund Freud. Uh, this is in 1913, by 1914, uh, Freud and Jung never spoke again. So this is in the transition period between the Munich conference in 1912, where there was a vote of no confidence in Jung's, he was president of the International Psychoanalytic Association at that time, but the people from Vienna abstained from voting uh, in the, in the re-election uh, vote. And um, uh, Jung uh, in 1914, he resigned uh, because he said that he uh, would not uh, subject himself to ad hominem attacks. So there's a, this is a historically significant postcard. Uh, there is a, another psychoanalytic theory that I'd just like to mention. It's, a, it's an anthropological and, and psychological theory. Uh, Werner Munsterberger was also a cultural anthropologist. He edited a whole series of books on anthropology, cultural anthropology and psychoanalysis. And uh, I, I do uh, um, have this kind of sense of some items that I collect. Uh, some individuals collect items that they imagine contain some special energy. In cultural anthropology, it's called mana. In psychoanalysis, it's called libido. Uh, defined not as psychosexual energy in particular, the way the Freudians do, but more expansively and inclusively as psychic energy in general, as Jungians do. Uh, these individuals experience and regard such items as relics, as what Werner Munsterberger calls magically potent objects. In other words, they contain some kind of special charismatic or, or, or energy, like a kind of aura or something to them. Now, if you look at this postcard, it's historically significant. It's about the breakup and Jung is really uh, genuinely saying in there, I don't understand why you won't discuss our differences of opinion here. It seems to me that in a scientific activity, uh, everybody naturally has dif differences of opinion, uh, uh, disagreements and so forth and so on. And why are you reducing my disagreements? You're saying it's because I have personal complexes about things. He says, this is a nothing but approach and he's quoting William James at that point, who came up with the idea of, of being reductive here and saying some kind of phenomena is nothing but something else of a lower level. So that your, your scientific differences are nothing but your personal complexes. So they can just be dismissed and not discussed. And so Jung is writing about this in a very serious way. He's sending it to Jones. And you notice that on the card that's on the right-hand side, the front of the card, it, down at the bottom, Jung has written and underlined it. Please tear up. 
Well, now guess what uh, Ernest Jones promptly did as soon as he got the card and read it himself. Anyone want to guess? He forwarded it straight to Sigmund Freud, okay, to show uh, how uh, unloyal, how disloyal Carl Jung was. Uh, and uh, so now, if I'm talking in modern terms about the potent, uh, what the magically potent object here and what that potency or libido or mana consists of, one could say, well, maybe if we had a forensic person in here, that person could uh, test to see whether there's any remainder of DNA from Carl Jung, Ernest Jones and Sigmund Freud. You see, I have a kind of fantasy about that. Like I now possess, I could, my DNA is on those cards. I'm mingling with the greats of all time, okay? And so I have these cards. Uh, I don't know, I paid maybe $1,000 or $1,500 for each of these cards, uh, I don't know, 15 or 20 years ago. Uh, I know that they, uh, the, the, um, the uh, I don't know, market for young memorabilia has gone way up, but that's not why I have them. That's not why I got them in the first place. I'm not interested in acquiring things as investments or as a means to some other end. I, I have these things because I love them for some peculiar reason that may defy all explanation. So that's all I have to say. Uh, and um, uh, thank you very much. All right, thank you, Dr. Adams. That was uh, quite a fascinating intro. Uh, appreciate all of the the relevant context and you setting the stage for us. I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Muller now uh, to come to the virtual stage. Thank you, JD. I, I am so glad that Dr. Adam mentioned Munster River because I think we both feel the same probably about Munsterberger, and that is that he, based on his clients that he saw, he thought they were either deprived or depraved if they collected. So I'm Shirley Muller and let's fast forward to the early uh, mid to late 1990s. Munsterberger's book was published in 1994. And Munsterberger was basing all of his ideas, uh, what he could conjure in his head after seeing patients or when seeing patients. The same thing happened about a century earlier or almost a century earlier with Sigmund Freud, who expressed collecting as a sublimation of one's surplus libido. Jung came along and to my knowledge, I know very little about Jung, but he had a much greater basis in biology and why he thought people collected. Now, in the 1990s, we finally began to have tools that would allow us to actually investigate scientifically why people collect, why people do anything. And that's what I'm hoping we can address today in a very short 10 minutes or less. Uh, first slide, please. Actually, we're gonna start with the second slide. Second slide, please. So this is what I collect and it's Chinese porcelain, porcelain made in China and exported to the West. And it's been my passion since the late 1980s or 1990s. I've devoted a lot of my time and effort to it. And by doing this, I've gotten so much pleasure. It's meant so much to me. I've met new people. I've been able to write articles, I've been able to go on trips, I've been able to think about where I'm going to deaccess this, whether to a museum or privately, so other people or can gain pleasure just like I did. When I was going on this path, next slide please, this path of collecting, similar to what JD has gone on, and also um, Dr. Adams, I began to think about some of the choices that I was making. You know, some of them didn't seem quite logical. And I began to wonder why that was. 
uh, as a neurologist, previously a practicing neurologist who did a lot of research, you know, I was trained to ask questions. And the question I was asking myself is, why am I not always logical? In fact, maybe I'm hardly ever logical when I make collecting choices. What is going on here? And that led me to explore, next slide, the scientific basis of why we collect, which we didn't really even have this information available until in the 90s when MRI became available, magnetic resonance imaging. And many of you have already had it to some part of your body uh, to determine what is wrong in a particular organ. Now, somewhere along the line, late 1990s, early 2000s, something called functional magnetic resonance imaging came along, which is even more sophisticated than MRI. And what this allows is for wherever, whatever is being looked at by the person in the imaging machine, what part of the brain that stimulates by a change in oxygen in that particular part, because now think of when you go to exercise, your muscle exercises, it takes more oxygen. In your brain, when during cognition, during thinking about something specific, your, that area of the brain that's thinking about it also takes more oxygen. So this allows scientists to tell what's going on in the brain. Next slide. Now, there are two areas where we can address decision-making when we make collecting choices, or in fact, any, any uh, decision in life. So what we learned about life in general, decisions in general, applies to collecting. As far as we know, certainly it should. So the area of neuroeconomics, which is the physical study of the brain itself, what happens when we make choices? And the other area that helps us understand what choices we make is behavioral economics, which is the application of social and psych psychology to our decisions. We're gonna concentrate most today on the neuroeconomics. And uh, I think any of you who have read uh, Daniel Kahneman's book probably already know a lot about behavioral economics, which he did emphasize. Next slide. So the brain is consisted of three parts, and this is really not very hard because we're gonna do kind of a gross overview here. But the top part of the brain, the neocortex, you see it on the top? Now, until these studies were done, these scientific studies that I'm talking about, people used to think we were totally rational and we made all our decisions with our neocortex. They used to think that about investment decisions as well as other decisions. And then as scientific data began to roll in, it became evident that, wow, the area of the brain that's active when we're making a lot of decisions, maybe up to 95% of decisions, is a limbic system, which is just below the neocortex. And you see it here. It's, it's a the emotional part of the brain. And it sits upon the reptile brain, which has to do with uh, blood pressure, heart rate, and so on, which we're not gonna discuss at all today. But the limbic system plays importantly into our decisions. Next slide. So I'm just gonna give you some examples of this, what the functional magnetic resonance imaging discovered. Our pleasure center is deep in our brain in the emotional area, the limbic system. And you see here the areas that are red, that is the pleasure center, the nucleus accumbens. So most of us, when we think of chocolate cake, our pleasure center is stimulated. Next slide. On the other hand, when we go to shop for an object, if it's more than we think it should be, we have price concerns and the insula, which is also deep in the brain in the limbic system is stimulated. And we see that in the yellow color here, deep in the brain. Next slide. 
And also when we make any kind of decision, our fear center can be activated. And this is because if we're frightened of something, we're going to not make the decision that we would if we weren't frightened, obviously. Next slide. So what is it that handles all of these factors, not just the three that I mentioned, not just the pleasure center, the price center, the fear center, but many more that we don't even know about today is the executive brain, which is at the front of the brain. We see that here in red. Again, that's where we used to think we made all our decisions, but no, now we know most of our decisions start essentially in our limbic system below the cerebral cortex, the thinking brain. It, um, go back just for a moment, please. Thank you. Um, a Harvard professor said that 95% of decisions are subconscious. That would be in the limbic, limbic system. I don't know if it's that many, but probably at least 80%. So we're making decisions all the time where we aren't using our cerebral cortex to maximum. Next slide. I want to show you an, um, a study which I think directly relates to the exhibit, this wonderful taxidermy exhibit. And I spent uh, a couple hours there with uh, JD and it was marvelous, not only to see these taxidermy animals, each of which had a story, but also to feel his passion about them. Uh, I would easily say he's a true collector. <laughs> um, so let's get back to uh, this study, which had to do with novelty. And I think that might be one reason why people collect what they collect. And in the case of taxidermy, certainly it might apply because collecting taxidermy is very, it's novel. Very few people do it. Although JD is gonna tell you more and more people are doing it evidently. I have him to thank for that. But you see here in this um, experiment, people were in a functional magnetic resonance imaging machine and they were shown pictures and the pictures were all the same. Let's say 20 pictures were the same, all one Adidas hat after another. And then all of a sudden a Fendi hat pops up and what happens in their brain? Next slide, a particular area is stimulated and that's the ventral tegmental area and the substantia nigra. And the importance of this is that both of these have rich collection, uh, connections to the pleasure center. So novelty stimulates these particular areas of, of the brain and they're feeding in then to the pleasure center. But there's more. Actually, the more unusual the novelty that was presented, the more the ventral tegmental area and the substantia nigra, nigra lit up, meaning sort of a dose response curve. Very exciting. Next slide. Now, why would this be? Because stimulation of the novelty center can lead to further explanation in anticipation of a reward. And think of this in terms of evolution. You know, you have a, a, someone several hundred thousand years ago who is willing to seek the novelty, willing to go after something new. And if it benefits this person and thereby the society in which he or she lives, it will enhance the group and they can go further in terms of sophistication. Next slide. Now, behavioral economics, we really aren't going to talk about today. Uh, some examples would be uh, anchoring on fairness and sunk cost. I just have to tell you about a wonderful experiment uh, relating to unfairness with uh, capuchin monkeys. When two capuchin monkeys are side by side, one cage from, from the other, but there's a, a divider in between, when one of them gets grapes and the other one gets like a carrot or something that is not its choice as a grape, the monkey that gets the less desirable food 
will just go like this. He'll rattle his cage and he'll yell and he'll just scream because he sees he's being untreated, treated unfairly. And we humans are the same, of course, which is why we'll never go back to a dealer who we think has perhaps charged more than he or she should have or sold what was not authentic. Next slide, please. I think that Daniel Kahneman in his book, Thinking Fast and Slow, just summed everything up in terms of uh, how we approach problems and choices. Humans are to thinking as cats are to swimming. We can do it when we have to, but we'd much prefer not to. And I think uh, some of you perhaps can relate to that today. And that's what I was finding um, when I was making decisions. And I wanted to share that with others. Next slide. So that, ne next slide, please. So that's what motivated me to write this book inside the head of a collector, Neuros Neuropsychological Forces at Play. And go back one, please. And then in summary, the process of collecting stimulates our pleasure center, which enhances our quality of life. In fact, think of going to work every day. Now, for many people, it's not that exciting. It's routine, routine, routine. It's okay, but it's not fulfilling us. But when we start collecting, we feel, we feel a passion that a job can't give us. Sometimes even our families don't give us, but collecting gives us a reason to live. But collecting isn't all pleasure. It involves a struggle between our emotions and logic. And by understanding this, we can not only increase pleasure and diminish pain, but we can also better, make better life decisions. So that's, a, that's the end of my presentation. All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Muller. Uh, and once again, Dr. Adams, fascinating stuff there. Certainly a lot to unpack, and I'm excited to do it in the time that we have. Um, we probably can't scratch the surface realistically um, because there are a lot of great insight there. And I have a lot of questions even related to my, my own experience. Um, we're going to try to go ahead and, and get started right away with that. And um, I'll start by, by a hypothetical or using a hypothetical, which is imagine that I'm your patient, I'm a new patient, and I've just made an appointment to come see you for uh, a, a psychiatric appointment, let's say, or, um, you know, sort of an interview style, uh, and I'm on the couch in your office. And I'm coming in specifically because I'm seeking assistance about what I describe as my addiction to collecting. What's the first question you might ask me in that context and why? I'll turn to Dr. Muller first. Well, I would be thinking in the back of my mind, aren't you lucky? But I wouldn't be saying that. <laughs> I, 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 I would be saying, tell me more. How much time do you spend collecting? Are you uh, ignoring other areas of your life? Mm -hmm. Have you stopped doing things with your family and your kids and uh, your friends? And then I would go on to say, what pleasure do these objects give you? And to address that, um, there is something called behavioral addiction. So it's not a physical addiction, but people can actually become, um, they have a need, for example, gaming, gamers have a need to game. Um, I believe that it's possible that there are some people who have a behavioral addiction to collecting. I think very few, maybe one, two percent, maybe less. But uh, I would be concerned that that might be the case if you came in with that particular chief complaint. Dr. Adams, what are your thoughts? What would you ask me in that context? 
Well, since I'm a psychoanalyst, I would just invite you to tell me anything you want to tell me, whatever is on your mind without uh, censoring anything, repressing anything, or holding your tongue, or being politically correct, or any other kind of thing, or worried about what I think about anything. Um, my position is that um, even though I have uh, the word clinical is in one of my licenses that uh, permits me, by which the government permits me to earn a living doing this activity, um, uh, that's, uh, that's, uh, I do not regard myself as um, within the medical or clinical paradigm. Uh, I think that's a wrong way to think about psychoanalysis. Uh, I believe it was a historical accident that this activity uh, came out of medicine. Uh, Freud was a neurologist and Jung was a psychiatrist and that's where it originated. But um, now um, of the vast majority of psychoanalysts are neither one of those things. Uh, most of them are social workers or some other kind of, um, they have some other kind of license. Um, my background is mainly in the humanities. Uh, I believe that uh, people without any medical or clinical background can be uh, uh, analysts uh, as good or better than people with those particular uh, credentials. And uh, uh, to me, the essence is not curing an illness, something called a quote, mental illness, which is not an organic illness. It's not a, it's not a brain illness. It's not a neurological illness. Uh, it used to, it's what used to be called functional illnesses. But in fact, it's not really an illness. And somebody like Thomas Saas, the great uh, psychoanalyst, um, you know, uh, uh, wrote a book, a famous book called The Myth of Mental Illness. So there's a, a great controversy about uh, why one would, uh, I don't know, a lot of my uh, colleagues, uh, they, they really do enjoy the word clinical. It gives them some kind of uh, scientific authority in their minds. It, it feels a little that they're on the hard sciences in some way instead of uh, uh, softies in the field. Uh, and they, I guess it's a way of proving their so-called manhood or something to be able to uh, claim such a, you know, a terminology. Uh, for me, uh, I'm not uh, interested in the curing of some putative illness. I'm interested in uh, the uh, transformation and expansion of consciousness. I think uh, the whole psychoanalytic product is about um, uh, unconsciousness. The theory was in the beginning that unconsciousness uh, makes you nervous. The more unconscious are, you are, the more nervous are you are, or the more anxious you are. And uh, the hope would be that if you can interpret yourself accurately or your dreams accurately or your activities accurately and become more conscious of things, then you become a person who's able to exercise more choice and uh, you are not uh, the victim of some kind of other process behind the scenes. And so um, a lot of people, I mean, uh, I know that Dr. Mueller in her uh, in, in the things I was reading about the, her book uh, uses, uh, likes to use the word passion. Uh, she says, it's not something, but it's a passion. Uh, and uh, that's, uh, I'm sympathetic to that. Um, and um, uh, I don't immediately or really ever like to pathologize things. I don't, one of my great shames is in my four books, I ever use the word patient. Uh, I see individuals who come to me and sometimes I uh, jokingly refer to them as customers. I think that's actually more honest than to call them patients and to say they're in treatment with me. Uh, I, I, there are clinical evenings at, at the Jungian Association I belong to. I don't attend any of the clinical evenings. I've told them if they would just rename them analytic evenings, then I would show up. But I, my question is, where is the clinic? Mm -hmm. And so I'm not, I'm not uh, you know, I'm, uh, I'm interested in these things in terms of uh, the question of your motivation and your intention. And I'm not presuming anything negative about it or that you have some kind of problem. If you think something's a problem, or if your wife or somebody thinks it's a problem and then you think, well, maybe it's a problem, then we can talk about that. Mm -hmm. But I'm not sitting there uh, uh, presuming anything in advance. Uh, so that would be some kind of uh, notion about how I might uh, um, sit there in someone's presence, trying to think about uh, how conscious they are of something and uh, uh, how otherwise they might be uh, differently conscious. Um, Understood. Yeah, that that certainly makes a lot of sense. I mean, I think going into that uh, or sort of extending from that a little bit, I'm not going to ask about the degree to which you think serious collecting represents some sort of um, 
pathology. We've already talked about Munsterberger and other examples, but I guess I've, I've sometimes been accused of being a hoarder or having hoarder-like tendencies. Um, obviously, when taken to that extreme, um, there is a certain amount of disruption of, of life and, and perhaps discomfort uh, that goes beyond serious collecting. So I wonder if you could just, from your experience, uh, draw any relevant distinctions uh, between collecting at a very aggressive scale and, and being a so-called hoarder. Dr. Adams, maybe you first this time. Well, um, um, the person I live with, my dear wife, uh, if she had her druthers, uh, she would uh, live in a completely Zen environment. Mm. Uh, she is the opposite of a collector, in fact. Uh, she doesn't have... Um, what I think is a kind of a statistically normal interest in uh, obtaining and retaining objects. Uh, she doesn't have uh, attachments like sentimental value to material objects in the world in the way that I do or a lot of people have. And so I don't think she has a single collection, mm -hmm. you see. And in fact, uh, the things you see on the wall behind me, including a painting of her by somebody's, uh, some artist, uh, 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 you know, her ideal room would be kind of like all white or something like that. She wouldn't have very many objects around and all that sort of thing. So, you know, uh, the people we live with, our family, our friends and all that sort of thing, uh, if we're going to have con uh, relationships that continue over any amount of time, you know, we have to kind of uh, psychologically realize that uh, they're not clones or twins or some other kind of thing. And that it's uh, really unworkable pragmatically for us to expect them to feel the same way about certain things that we feel. And so uh, there are accommodations, divisions of labor and all this sort of thing that are uh, highly important in this kind of thing. Uh, people can have a kind of passionate, again, to use that word, passionate interest in something. They may even get a lot of something See, in some ways you're kind of talking about, well, when does this pass over from a collecting to addiction or something like that, or mm -hmm. from uh, expressions of serious and, and uh, uh, passionate interest in something, when the, and the, you like to say aggressive pursuit of something, uh, one might just say the um, energetic pursuit of something, because aggressive has a certain kind of connotation, which could be thought of as kind of negative here. But you know, you put a lot of energy into acquiring the kinds of things you do, and, um, you know, I would, uh, I would have to ask you, do you regard them, whatever anybody else may think, as uh, sort of obsessive compulsive uh, uh, motivations on your part? Mm -hmm. I mean, can you not stop buying uh, taxidermy dogs? Um, you know, if you had all the money <laughs> in the world, you know, <laughs> if you had question. all the money in the world, would you try to buy all of them? You know, or do you have a selection principle? Do you only buy ones that you told me about your first First a dog, I guess, or some, some piece you bought first and you said it had a particular, it spoke to you in a certain way. Yes. And so it wasn't just some kind of thing that was in a class of things like a taxidermist, I mean, like not a taxidermist, but a taxonomist. You're not the taxidermist as a taxonomist here, I think. You have some more individual uh, intimate interest in these particular things, the expression of the dog or something like that. I don't know what what it is that attracts you to them. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Well, I can take a stab at it. The, the, the piece that you're referring to is, was actually not a dog, but a, a kudu, which is a type of antelope. And that, that particular piece is on display, I guess for its very last uh, day, beginning tomorrow at the Apex Art Gallery. Uh, but it, it was very much a sort of um, an intimacy of sorts that I established with the piece. Uh, where I felt that it was speaking to me in a way. So the concept of, of mana or a, a sort of um, mm, psychological energy, a, a power, a libido, uh, I've, I felt a sense of that when I first saw the piece hanging on the wall in an antique shop. So certainly um, I think that has, has translated into wanting to try to repeat uh, that experience with greater or lesser degrees of success as I've gone out and tried to network and find these objects of desire. And, you know, 
I guess more pointedly with respect to whether I think that is a problem, um, I, you know, I think it depends. I see both sides of it. Certainly, I think my uh, dedication to it may border on obsession, possibly uh, on addiction, uh, but one that I think for the most part is relatively uh, harmless, victimless. It's not something that I feel distressed uh, by. I, I feel, uh, as Dr. Muller suggested, a, a, a very um, a sense of passion when it comes to pursuing these things and an energy and a drive to do so. Um, and I, I think there are other interesting aspects of it. For example, you know, often after I attain an object, um, I'm perhaps less enthusiastic about it or the process of seeking it out, competing for it and acquiring it certainly is um, imbued with a greater level of energy and satisfaction than actually the actual act of possessing the object over time. Mm -hmm. So I may just with that, turn it over to you, Dr. Muller. Any, any thoughts about that concept of why is it that as, as collectors, we pursue these objects relentlessly and with great passion. And then very often, once we obtain them, sure, we put them on a wall, on a shelf, in a cabinet. We appreciate them, but not with the same, not with the same vigor uh, as, as going after them. Absolutely. Uh, the pleasure center is stimulated the most when we anticipate getting what we want. And once we have it, it doesn't light up with the same brightness. So that's why many collectors, when they, they chase something, it might take them years, but they find that desired object. And once they get it, they put it on a shelf and forget it and think about what they want next and, and repeat over and over again. So that's why collectors really never stop collecting because they love the thrill of the, thrill of the chase, that stimulation of the pleasure center that's max. Mm -hmm. um, the only way I think for many people to stop collecting is to transfer that passion to another passion. You know, in my case, I've started writing about collecting and now I, I don't need to collect as much. I, I'd still like to, but I'm able to suppress my desire uh, really quite easily. <laughs> I want to make an observation though about um, JD and his collecting. When we spent two hours together, to me, what I saw was a lot of intellectual curiosity. You know, he could tell me about every single object and not only where he purchased it, because that was minor, but more about what it meant to him in terms of his search for, I think for just intellectual stimulation. You know, the, like the crocodile shells, <laughs> whoo, now those are special. <laughs> and you had some alligator uh, features too. And um, I think they would kind of catch anybody's eye. Well, yeah, I mean, and, and certainly uh, those sort of collections within collections, as you're referring to, I do have a, a rather large collection of shelves uh, in the, the form of the heads of crocodilians, uh, all uh, antique pieces. That was a popular style in the Victorian and uh, Edwardian era is to, to take a uh, uh, take a crocodile, whether it was a gharial, I have quite a few of those, and sort of an Indian crocodile, very rare and endangered species, or other types of similar animals, and essentially mount them heads facing down with a shelf on top of the back of the head. So there was a, a functional utility to those objects as well. So that is certainly an area I find fascinating. Switching gears a little bit, one of the things that, that I've often wonder about is, um, the, the degree to which collecting almost like sophisticated usage of tools is a human only endeavor. And, and Maya, I think you have a clip that I just like to, to briefly show here so that we can kind of all be on the same page, maybe just 30 seconds of it. So this is a clip of the male satin bowerbird. You may be familiar uh, with this bird. And it is famous for creating a, a vertically um, oriented straw-like 
uh, what looks like a nest, but that is the bower, which serves as sort of a stage uh, of sorts. It also collects more importantly, and I use the word collects loosely here, but objects that are made of, of uh, well, plastic, maybe feathers, possibly metal, but typically of a certain color. In this case, it's this species, sort of an indigo blue. And in effect, I've thought about this as possibly a primitive form of collecting. So we can cut off the clip there. This is used in the context of the birds, the male birds mating display. And the female will come to that bower and essentially stand in it while the male performs a mating display using these objects of, of desire that are all sort of curated and have sort of um, achieved a high degree of, of specialization and specificity, I should say, in that they're almost invariably this sort of indigo blue color of various forms. So, you know, I wonder your thoughts about that. Is, is, is collecting a human endeavor is what the bower bird here uh, where I, I've also mentioned that in my, my essay on the nature of the beast, so we're sort of coming full circle in a way, is what the bower bird is doing, is, is that collecting? Dr. Muller, you can go first this time. I think there is a researcher at the University of Michigan, her first name is Stephanie, and I am not remembering her last name, but she studies this phenomena of collecting in animals. And I think that it is her, her research bears out that some animals, not all, but do collect. Uh, I mean, obviously squirrels have to uh, collect for the winter and um, bower, the bower bird apparently collects to make a nest that will attract females. And as I remember, there were bowls uh, that also collected but she has a regular little animal uh, husbandry group that she <laughs> studies and uh, it shows convincingly that animals, some animals do collect as well. Okay, Dr. Adams, any thoughts? <clears throat> well, you had mentioned this to me as a possible topic today. So I gave it a little bit of thought and I did have the squirrel, squirrel away things. Um, mm -hmm. But isn't that just to die? Isn't that different, though? I mean, obviously, squirrels are, for the most part, collecting and storing food. So we don't think about people as collecting food. That's just necessary well, for survival. Uh, well, it's a particular use of the word collecting, and it's certainly in the dictionary. One could uh, loosely say that people are collecting things if they are acquiring things. Uh, and especially if it seems to be are they all blue or something like that? One could one could make that kind of uh, um, I don't know. To me, it would not be semantically very definite, but mm. one could say such a thing, and you wouldn't be completely out of line linguistically. Um, on the other hand, uh, uh, the squirrels, as you say, they are saving and storing something that specifically food uh, for. Um, the winter time when these things are not going to be available and it's a, and the cows are not doing this. And I mean, so it depends on what animal you're talking about and what kind of environment they inhabit and uh, how they have evolved and all of these kinds of things like that. So uh, it's, um, it's not, uh, it would not be a good idea to generalize about animals. Uh, and uh, a, a, you're quite, uh, you're there right to say that from my perspective, squirrels are not collecting in the sense that you collect or that Dr. Muller collects. Uh, in fact, it seems to me that uh, so P the some certain animals get certain kinds of things as means to some other end. They are instrumental. They serve some sort of kind of purpose. They have a use that they are put in terms of some of some other kind of maybe future uh, activity. Uh, the brilliant thing about the Chinese porcelain. And the brilliant thing about the uh, taxidermy dogs and other uh, creatures uh, is that they have absolutely no practical va use or value at all on, on that level. Uh, both of you have uh, taken some things which, I mean, I don't know about the animals, but certainly uh, those beautiful uh, examples of Chinese porcelain, theoretically, once upon a time, uh, something was served in them or they, they, I mean, I'm assuming that they weren't always simply ornamental or decorative. And so, you know, uh, they have been taken out of circulation at some point. 
And it seems to me at that, at that point, their use value to you be, be Karl Marx for a minute, that they, they don't have the kind of use value they once had. They are in fact, part of the thing that makes them collectible or part of a collection is that they are in those terms, useless. You know, right. uh, and and uh, and so uh, they're valuable. Dr. Miller drinks they're, a lot of tea. They're valuable <laughs> only. You know, I mean, you would be appalled if some guest came over and took your thing and filled filled it up and drank from it or whatever. I mean, this would be violating the whole basis of collecting, it seems to me. Or if they tried to take one of your taxidermies uh, out to walk. I mean, they'd have to be a Dadaist or a surrealist or something. You know, Man Ray might do that. It might be a kind of a wonderful joke. But aside from that, uh, you know, they are objects that are taken out of certain context and put in another context, like an exhibition. They have some kind of display value. Mm -hmm. It's not a kind of uh, use value in that other sense. The squirrel's nuts have a definite use value. Mm -hmm. You see, and when Joseph interprets the Pharaoh's dreams of the fat and lean cows and the, uh, the uh, full and thin uh, wheat, uh, and that this is going to have some kind of analogy to uh, years of plenty, seven years of plenty and seven years of scarcity or feast and famine. You know, that's kind of trying to get all the humans to be like squirrels, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, the dream comes to the Pharaoh and that's how Joseph interprets it. And so as Ben Carson says, they put all that wheat in the pyramids. Yeah. Right. And remember him Speaking saying that. Dreams. Okay. Well, Speaking you know of what? dreams, Dr. Adams. I, I don't know if I'm allowed to ask this, and I don't know if you're allowed to answer, but I would like to know about Bill Clinton's dreams. Uh, well, you and I could have a private, uh, well, I mean, we got the book. Uh, all you have to do is first order the book, Dreaming of Bill. Oh, oh Dreaming of a, Bill. Did you there write the book? book? Yes, it's, it was there on that slide, Dreaming of Bill. Okay, all right. Okay, and it's it's from a long time ago. But it's all sorts of people who want to go on a date with Bill, and uh, where Bill is uh, uh, tricking them, and Bill, uh, Bill is doing being Bill, okay, uh, or Slick Willie, as he liked to be called, right, or the people in Arkansas called him that. So it's a, uh, it's and Hillary's in some of them. This is well, you know, it was a long time ago. Uh, it, uh, it's, I think it may be uh, pre Monica. I'm not sure, but um, you know, it's an interesting book. There, I have a book on the dreams of uh, the, the royals in Britain from many, many years ago. And then there are Madonna's dreams, dreams of Madonna. And uh, they're, they're, uh, they're, they're interesting and amusing and they're, they're fascinating, you know. Uh, it's one kind of book of dreams. You can buy William Burroughs' book of dreams. Jim Saw Shaw, the great artist, uh, is, um, has illustrated all his dreams in a, in a wonderful book. Um, uh, the, the, the Jack Kerouac has a book of dreams. There are all sorts of kind of interesting. Theodore Adorno, you can get Adorno's dream book. Uh, all sorts of dreams. R. Crumb, R. Crumb's dream book. You know, so that- No, I mean, short, no shortage wouldn't of- to, Who wouldn't want to collect the dreams of all of those uh, incredibly crazy people, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so getting back to, and I'm cognizant of the time that we've got about 10 minutes or so left and it's, Sadly, just not nearly enough to cover everything that I would want to cover, let alone audience questions. But but getting back to the the squirrels for a minute, in a, in a manner of speaking, there's sort of um, a Jungian idea, as I understand it, of, of collective memory, um, Dr. Adams. And I, I think with respect to how that might apply, I mean, I've heard it applied to collecting behavior as sort of a, a modern equivalent of what might originally been adaptive societal behavior as far as hunter-gatherer societies having to go out and look for food uh, or look for objects that might have some functional utility. Uh, obviously, most of us are not living in that kind of society in 2021, uh, but I, I guess I would just be curious in terms of whether that sort of explanation for for collecting this this idea that uh, it is based on uh, I don't want to say primitive but but certainly a a series of behaviors that was more typical of early human societies to what degree does that play into this sort of uh, pursuit of objects as we you know know it today with respect to collecting 
Um, well, I'm happy to try to say something about that. I don't, I don't know that we have enough time really to do much with that, but um, uh, you mentioned when we were talking uh, before today, mm -hmm. something about uh, acquiring things is the word you use. Earlier, I used obtaining and retaining because I thought I was gonna be poetically clever, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, but uh, acquiring things, even a large number of things, or even a large number of the same kind, is not necessarily collecting as I understand it. You see, because you may be acquiring a whole lot of something. Uh, you might be acquiring a whole lot of, uh, of, of uh, art. You might have a so-called art collection, but it's really just stored somewhere in Switzerland in a vault. But waiting for the price to go up, and it's just an—it's just like a stock or something. It's not what I would call an art collection, okay? Because it doesn't have the passion or the individual connection to it or any kind of thing like that. It's some other kind of activity. It's acquiring things, or it's investing, or it has some other kind of proper name. Uh, it, it just superficially resembles what I would call true collecting, and so like. Collecting is kind of pointless or purposeless in some way, except for the common denominator of the, the weird individual who feels for whatever strange reason that they just can't get enough of uh, taxidermy dogs or porcelain, uh, you know, ceramics. Uh, and I'm totally sympathetic, you know. I think it's kind of funny that we do these things. But I don't, uh, don't imagine that it serves some grand evolutionary purpose or something like that. For one thing, uh, 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 evolutionary theory, Darwinian theory and all that is, is about uh, the um, survival value of certain kinds of activities by the whole species, not by an individual. So you would have to say that the species Homo sapiens, we, ha we have now witnessed on a large scale, pervasively across the species, engaged in something that we could legitimately call collecting in some significant way. And uh, even to begin with, because the survival value is not about you and me and all that sort of thing. In fact, you said to me that you started a software company and only after you had achieved a certain kind of stability and wealth and whatever like that, or you used the word resources, you had gotten enough resources together so that you could indulge this passion and you know turn yourself uh, in the direction of collecting. It reminded me of hein Heinrich Schliemann the great sh guy who went into shipping, became a shipping magnet in order to eventually finance his dream, which was to try to find Troy and the gold of Troy. You know, so uh, in fact, you could say that, that somebody really establishes his survival and reproductive capacity and all of that sort of thing as a member of the species. And then he engages, he's free to engage in some useless activity that some member of the family might complain about, you know. <laughs> Uh, well, cutting, you know, cutting, cutting JD, close to home there. <laughs> JD, you know, when JD described his journey from being a tech entrepreneur into collecting, I felt like he was self actuating himself. He was just looking. He needed something more, and that's what collecting brought him. And I can sympathize with that because when I was uh, practicing as a physician, I was working 80 hours a week. I was dead tired all the time. I only thought about my patients. And what saved me was to begin to be interested in Chinese porcelain. And it brought a whole new other, uh, I guess you could say, reason for existence. So I could finally leave seeing patients every day and embark on a whole new life. So I think collecting, in, for some people, some of the time involves being able to move on with one's life. Because it, as JD said, we don't harm anyone. Uh, we have a passion, but it's not hurting anybody. Mm -hmm. In fact, in this society, it's really accepted, which is a very appealing, I think. Mm -hmm. So there are a couple questions from the audience. And again, we're not gonna have time to do more than scratch the, the surface uh, of them, but um, I, just to try to take a stab at it, uh, there is a question that relates to the cultural component as sort of a modulator of what's considered a normal degree of a desire to collect, right? So I guess if you have any thoughts around 
cultural relativism with respect to this desire? Are there societies where collecting is, let's say, for example, unknown or frowned upon? Is there anything from your work or your experience that would specifically relate to why people collect and the view of collecting from a, a, a cultural standpoint, Dr. Muller? Well, if the young people say that they are collecting experiences, that they don't need to collect objects. Now, from my point of view, when they collect experiences, they take pictures to prove that they've had this experience. Mm -hmm. So in a way they are collecting. Mm -hmm. They have the pictures to show that they collected this experience, but they don't have anything else. So and Instagram, for example, might be an example of that. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. And collectors who collect objects have not only the experiences, maybe some pictures, probably some pictures, but also they have an object to show later. Mm. So I, from my point of view, I think co real life collecting of real life objects is, I think, ultimately more satisfying. Okay. For example, I can't even remember, like we, if we went to India 10 or 15 years ago and we have pictures, but I never look at them. But I do look at a piece of Chinese porcelain that I purchased 10 or 15 years ago probably every other day. Hmm. And Dr. Adams, thoughts on culture and its influence? Well, uh, I have no uh, direct knowledge of any kind of systematic research into cross-culturally uh, to a, com a kind of comparative sense to say that uh, one ethnic group or one culture uh, collects and then another one doesn't, or this one collects these things, but not those things, or, I mean, different groups uh, do have their different cultural practices. They have their different cultural prefer preferences, uh, practices as preferences. Uh, they have their habits and mores and conventions and all of those kinds of things. Uh, and so it's, uh, to me, I'm always on the side of culture and not so much on the side of nature. So it may even be that Dr. Miller and I differ in some, some ways about this. You see, I'm not a neurologist, I'm a psychologist. And, uh, you know, I have some strong feelings about, um, you know, different kinds of approaches. And uh, I, again, like Jung with his letter to Ernest Jones, I'm all uh, happy at any point to have a, a kind of discussion about differences and things like that. And I don't get a bit out of shape, you know, with somebody thinking that uh, Jungians are full of nonsense and why are you wasting your time in Jungian analysis? Uh, I'd be happy to talk about it if somebody wants to. But, you know, uh, uh, that seems to me a very valuable question. I just don't think we have a good answer for it right now. It would, uh, it would take somebody, uh, maybe the, the questioner, to actually do some research into that and to try to uh, go and uh, find collectors in different cultures and see uh, uh, how the, how they, whether they have some feeling about how their culture looks on collecting and whether they frown on it as a, a sort of a, a Therostorsen Beblin conspicuous consumption thing or uh, some leisure class activity. I mean, there might be all sorts of attitudes toward, toward collecting uh, and, uh, you know, in different cultures. So, Anthropologically, I would be all for somebody uh, trying to uh, inform us about that. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, I know, Dr. Muller, I think you, you uh, have to leave us. Um, and I think, you know, that, that's as good a place to end it as any. I know that there are, there are more questions. We'll try to get responses to those questions after the fact, since we're, we're simply out of time. But um, Great discussion. I uh, certainly appreciate both of you uh, willing to, both of your willingness to share, be with us this afternoon and um, lend your insight to this, uh, this topic, which has fascinated me for a very long time. Um, with that, I will, I will thank you both once again. Thank the Apex Art team. I'll turn it back to Maya for some closing remarks, but this is really fascinating and important stuff and uh, certainly, um, your efforts to enlighten us both this afternoon and in your respective books and publications, which I certainly encourage everyone uh, to go out and, and purchase. A fascinating reading for me uh, in preparation for this, but um, uh, really just couldn't thank you more.